Steve Sand Sandberg. You are a Swedish writer, critic and journalist. You wrote for the Svenska Dagblad and in 2009 you received the August Prize for your novel The Fatigue I Lodge. Uh, prize is similar to the Deutsche Buchpreis. This book deals about the ghetto of Lodge from April 1940 when it was sealed until its liberation in January 1945. Uh, the Fatigue Lodge has been translated into German by Gisela Kozubek and it now has been published by Klett Cotta. You did use historical documents, but you have written a novel. Which documents did you use and which role take it in the novel? Well, there were <coughs> what, what is in unique about the Ghetto Wing Watch yes. is that it survived a lot of documents. Um, mainly, uh, there is a 3,500 page <coughs> long chronicle that is basically a day-by-day -day account of what happened in, in the ghetto from one day to another. It started in January 41 and it kept on keeping this record until the next to last day before the last deportation. And of course this has been my main source uh, for, for, for the book. Uh, not in so much that I've taken parts from the Chronicle and putting it into my text, but more like an inspiration. Mm -hmm. And it's also been, so to speak, the chronological backbone of the book, uh, which gives the book the, the basic uh, structure and so on. But there are also many other documents I've used, I mean, from uh, survivors and so on. Yes, but there are also quotations of documents in the book. There are, from the Chronicle, there are two yes. uh, direct quotes from the Chronicle. Uh, but that is not much because the book is 700 pages, so... so. The Germans nominated Mordai Chaim Rumkowski as the head of the Council of the Elders, a sort of local government in the mm -hmm. ghetto. Rumkowski is still a very controversial figure. What is your position? Did he collaborate? Was he a trade traitor? Or did he really succeed in the protection of the Jewish people? <coughs> if I would have known the answer to this question, I would not have needed to write the book. Uh, the book is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that the book gives a positive answer to all of these three questions. He was all three things at the same time. And that's what really makes him a, quite a devastating person. He, he, he had a vision, and I believe that was sincere. He was mm -hmm. very honest that he thought that he, in his hands, his hands were the only ones who could could save the Jews mm -hmm. uh, during the occupation, but he also, as everybody at, knows, Hannah Arendt has discussed Trumkowski, for example, in her, her book about Eichmann in Jerusalem, Jerusalem tries, and, and she says the same, he, 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 he act, actually and willingly collaborated with the German occupiers in order to achieve that goal. And then you, as a reader yourself, have to decide uh, which view you will take. I, I mean, for a long time and up until the summer of 1944, there were still uh, in the ghetto of Wuj uh, about 70,000 Jews still working mm -hmm. in the ghetto. So, uh, if history had taken a different course, maybe there would have been a different outcome and Runkowski would have been judged differently. But I'm, I'm not a judge, I'm a writer. Yes. And uh, I try in my book to put all the possible interpretations into the book and I hope the reader will be intrigued by, by the story so much that he will make his own decision and yes. have his own opinion. Lodz was the only ghetto in Poland and also in the other, in the other occupied um, countries which was not controlled by the SS. Is this you to Rumkowski? Oh, th this question you have to ask a historian. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm not an historian and I have not, I mean, gone as deep into the power structures of, of, of the SS or, or, or the German, um, so to speak, uh, hierarchy here. Uh, my main consideration in, in the book is, uh, is directed towards the, the ordinary people, the Jews that mm -hmm. were incarcerated in this, in this place. And I, 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 I do not try to find, um, go beyond the ghetto fences or the ghetto borders yeah. in this sense. Um, there was a power struggle, <coughs> excuse me, there were 
attempts from the SS to take it over. They didn't succeed. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the historian will have the answer for, for why this was the case. Yes. What elements, for example, did you use in your novel to clarify the role of Rumkowski? So the, uh, I want to know um, which elements the reader finds to, to, to um, have an, an own decision. I mean, I, I, I try to put as much in as, 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 as possible. I mean, we are lucky because in the Ghetto Chronicle there are also preserved many of the, or I would say most of the speeches he actually held during these uh, more than four years uh, of, of, of uh, where, where the ghetto was in place. And, and you can deduce a lot from, from the way he spoke and the way he, he tried to tell his people, so to speak, Uh, the truth without telling the truth. Mm -hmm. or somebody would mm -hmm. say he lied yeah. to them, yeah. and so on. And and it's um, it's um, I mean it's rhetorically fascinating to see how he he he, he describes himself as the leader of of the, of, of, of the Jews and how he also describes the deportations. Mm -hmm. So there are many many different uh, documents uh, I, I've tried to use, but also of course private correspondences, and also of course the diaries that have been kept uh, or was kept during during uh, this time, which some of which have been preserved mm -hmm. and which mm -hmm. you still can read. And this, of course, give a, 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 a quite a different uh, perspective on Rumkowski than the official one, which is the one you can read in the Ghetto Chronicle. When did Rumkowski and the inhabitants of the ghetto know that the resettlement to the east was a deportation to concentration camp and into the death? Well, <laughs> That depends on what you mean by by the by the word no. Yeah. I mean. When, when, when did they learn it? Well, well, I didn't think they ever did. Uh, I didn't think they ever did. I mean, um, Runkowski was all the time telling them that they were they were going to uh, to work outside the ghetto, but at the same time, uh, the belongings of those who had been deported, the deportees, yeah. clothes. Um, Uh, with the carry-on luggages and so on came back to the to the ghetto to be sorted again mm -hmm. and recycled and reproduced. And from the, from the fact that there was blood on the clothes, you could you could you could assume, of course, that nobody would have survived. But but the, the point I was trying to make in the ghetto is that in in the book, sorry, is that that you, you can know without knowing. You can you can you can hope also when there is no real cause for hope mm -hmm. and there is a saying in Swedish that you would say something like hope is the last thing that ever ever escapes yes. a human being and <clears throat> it's clearly visible in the in the ghetto chronicle because those who wrote the chronicle would have known of course what 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 were they their destinies but still in 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 the summer of 1944 before the last trains left mm -hmm. for Auschwitz There was still this hope or this presumption that maybe, maybe, maybe now the war is over and we will finally come out. Mm -hmm. And in that makes a um, um, very, um, very emotional reading, I think, for 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 us now when when we see when we see how how, how little they knew and how much they were in the center of everything that happened. Yes. When did Rumkowski and the other um, inhabitants of the ghetto know something about the defeat of the German in Stalingrad? Um, it, it's a, a, a question also that that you have to put maybe to a historian. Yes. Uh, yes. I think some some would have known quite quickly because there were people who illegally listened to radio. radio, radio and, yes. And uh, I mean, uh, and and news, of course, in this environment, they 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 went from from mouth to mouth mm -hmm. very very fast. So so I think quite a few people knew. Um, uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, very, not, not many days afterwards. But, but the point is that I think that most of the people in the ghetto, they were so preoccupied or occupied with, with the basic thing of finding food, yes. that they, they didn't, or the basic things of surviving from day to day, that they, they, they maybe not gave this the kind of thought that we would. We yes. would. A last question, who should read your book? I think everybody should read my book. Yes. And I think one of the points of the book is, is that it's trying to close the gap, if it's possible at all, but fiction can do that kind of thing, to close the gap between us here, now, and they, there, then. Yes. And I think it's 70 years, 
but it's not so long ago. And I think that the way I describe the people in, in the ghetto is the way that, that uh, you would describe anybody living anywhere, any place. And that's the point of the book. And I think that everybody should, should read it for that reason. Not because it's a Holocaust novel, but it's because about the daily living of survival of people like us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Die Elenden von Lutsch erscheinen bei Klett Cotter.